Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new episode of Second Take Cinema coming at you from the glorious Impala Films headquarters in sunny Southend-on-Sea. As always, I'm your host Jamie Evans, joined as per usual by Rory Jocelyn. Hello everyone. Today we are turning back the time to 1953 to review a film that is, I think it's safe to say, is a classic of cinema. Yeah. We are talking about Roman Holiday. That's right, today we're talking about Roman Holiday, a 1953 American movie directed and produced by William Wyler, starring Audrey Hepburn in her first major role alongside Gregory Peck. This film was made for a budget of $1.5 million and grossed $12 million back in 1953 money. It won three Academy Awards and is one of the films that has been preserved in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress, who deemed it culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. It is supposed, it is widely considered one of the most romantic films in cinema history. The film received critical acclaim and is now considered a classic. Milt you notice this is a film that doesn't, I don't know if it's just because it's old. Oh no, there's the Rotten Tomatoes score. On most modern films, Rotten Tomatoes is the first thing it tells you, it's right at the bottom of this one. The film was well received with a 95% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The website's critical consensus reads, With Audrey Hepburn luminous in her American debut, Roman Holiday is as funny as it is beautiful and sets the standard for the modern romantic comedy. The film received critical acclaim and is now widely considered a classic. Milton Lubin of The Hollywood Reporter said the movie proves a charming, laugh-provoking affair that often explodes into hilarity. It has a delightful screenplay that sparkles with wit and outrageous humour that at times comes close to slapstick, and that the cinematographers do a fine job of incorporating Roman landmarks into the storyline. The New York Times observed that it was a natural, tender and amusing yarn with laughs that leave the spirit soaring. Peter Bradshaw of The Guardian noted that the film was a modern fairy tale whose two leads have a charm and innocence that irradiate the whole movie. Giving the film five out of five, Empire concluded that the film was a timeless, exuberant classic with Hepburn's naive sense of fun and perfectly charming performance matched equally by Peck's Lausch... Lausch? and charismatic worldly American. James Berardinelli of Real Views gave the film three and a half out of four, calling the movie a staple of the romantic comedy fans library and remains one of only a few black and white movies that modern audiences will willingly watch. Roman Holiday was the second most popular film at the US box office during September 1953, behind From Here to Eternity, grossing almost $1 million. It earned an estimated $3 million at the United States and Canadian box office during its first few months of release. While the domestic box office disappointed Paramount, it was very successful elsewhere, including the United Kingdom, hey, home turf, Man. where the film benefited from both the current romance between Princess Margaret and commoner Peter Townsend. No film studio could have bought such public publicity, Alexander Walker wrote, and a fad for Italian culture. Due to the film's popularity, both Peck and Hepburn were approached about filming a sequel, but this project never quite got off the ground. I believe the uh, European Vespa motorbike or scooter so, be, uh, gained a lot of popularity in sales after this film as well. well maybe that's a question in the quiz and maybe you should shut up. Oh. <laughs> Spoilers. Well, I wouldn't know it was in the quiz unless you just said it. At least I know you're getting one right. Yay! <laughs> so before we move on to talk about this classic of cinema, 
it's time to test Rory's knowledge. Here are 10 questions relating to Roman Holiday or people involved in Roman Holiday. Yes. Roman Holiday won three Oscar awards. It won Best Story, Best Costume, and... Best Actress. It did. It won Best Actress for Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. Her debut bloody movie. Yep. And she won it. Next question. The story for Roman Holiday, bear in mind it won the Best Story award, Yep. was written by a blacklisted writer who was blacklisted for being uncooperative yes. with the House American on Activities Yes. Thing. Yeah. Um, they actually made a film about it later where yeah, Brian Cranston played him. In 1999, they finally corrected their mistake and gave the award to this writer. Yep. Who was the writer? Donald Trumbo. So close. Dalton Trumbo. Oh, same difference. I'm not allowing it. Oh, piss off. Next question. Audrey Hepburn is most famous for playing Holly Golightly in which 1961 film based on a novella by Truman Capote? Uh, I don't know this, so I'm just going to go in My Fair Lady because I know she was in that. It's Breakfast at Tiffany's. I haven't seen that one yet. That's on my list to watch. No, but it's her, everyone knows it's her most famous film. I know of the film, but I don't know a character name without having seen it. Next question. And you should get this one. This yeah. one's just for you. Is it? Which which post apocalyptic nineteen fifty nine movie starred Gregory Peck alongside Ava Gardner, Fred Astaire, and Anthony Perkins? That's a strange one for you to bring up in this quiz because I'm the one who suggested that we watch it. On this which is show. why I put it in the quiz so I knew you'd get at least one right. Oh, okay. Well, you're very kind. Yeah, on the beach. On it the is beaches. on the beach. Yeah. Gregory Peck starred in which thriller? alongside Robert Mitchum, which would then be remade in 1991 by Martin Scorsese, starring Robert De Niro and Nick Nolte. Taxi Driver? Cape Fear. Ah, uh, okay. Gregory Peck played Nazi scientist Joseph Mengele in which 1978 film? I actually don't know. That um, he... I know he was in a... Mm, no, it's not going to be that. Sod it, let's go with it. Black Legion? I'm afraid it's the boys from Brazil. I was going to say, it's definitely not Black Legion, because Black Legion's earlier than that. During her career, Audrey Hepburn starred in two musicals. The first was called Funny Face. <laughs> the other was My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady. You're, if I'd have done that question the other way around, which fucked. I did consider, <laughs> would you have got it? No. <laughs> Audrey Hepburn played Maid Marian in Robin and Marian. I thought you were going to say Audrey Hepburn was born and raised in Mansfield. Yes, she was. <laughs> she drank Mansfield bitter, so it killed her. Audrey Hepburn played Maid Marian in Robin and Marian, but which famous Scotsman played Robin? Gerard Butler. No, come um, on. <laughs> Very famous Scottish actor. Billy Connolly. <laughs> Sean Connery. Oh, really? Yes. Interesting. Yes, James Bond himself. Mm. True or false? This is a 50-50 question. Mm. True or false? The reason the movie is in black and white is at the insistence of Gregory Peck. I know this is contested, though, is it not? Because there's the suggestion that it was black and white so that the cast wouldn't be overshadowed by the beauty of Rome. But then there's also, I've read another report that stated that it was black and white because Audrey Hepburn was an unknown actress... So they reduced the budget. So in order to save budget, they went to black and white well, Neither film. of those are the reason I've heard. Really? Mm. Those are the only two so I've is heard. Is it at the insistence of Gregory Peck, do you think? No. Correct. That is false. Yeah. Only because the two that I've heard have, have not been in his insistence. The correct answer that I'm aware of sure. is Paramount wanted the studio shot on their back lot. The film shot on their back lot. William Wyler wanted to shoot it in actual Italy. Mm. And Paramount basically said, well, the compromise is you've got less of a budget. Right. So the budget one was very similar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Because he insisted on shooting it in Italy and not in a studio. Okay. Um, It was the right choice. Yeah. And last question. 
What brand of scooter do they ride? Vespa. It is a Vespa, and they did see a whopping increase in sales yep. thanks to this movie. Well, in fact, they were basically, outside of Italy, they were essentially an unknown brand, apparently, yeah, yeah. until this film came out. Yeah, I think pretty much the whole mod scene ends up eventually owing itself to this movie. The mod scene of the 70s. Because they all drove around on scooters, but I actually don't think scooters... Which is kind of hilarious, because I bet they'd never admit that, would they? Oh, no. Is well, this... the, the mods were kind of the the youth culture of its times. They would not have admitted that it was due to a 20-odd-year-old rom-com film about the royalty. <laughs> they absolutely would not have admitted that. But um, So, yeah. well done. You got right. Uh, one... Five. You got five out of ten. Well done. That's 50%. Hey. Uh, that's a whopping 50%. Well done, sir. And we will be right back to talk about Roman Holiday after these commercial breaks. Okay, so Roman Holiday. Um, I put this one in. Um, I saw this film when I was about... 16 or 17 I bought an Audrey Hepburn box set completely randomly I had never seen a single Audrey Hepburn film in my life did you just like the cover or I was getting into film at mm. the time um at this point I already knew I was going to go to uni to do film and I had been very in my this was around the time I was just starting to branch out from horror because from the age of about 13 to 16 for those three years, pretty much if it was, if it wasn't horror, I didn't watch it pretty right. much. I was very, very into horror at that time. Um, and I, I, I did see the occasional non horror film, but I was really solidly yeah. like my, it. my DVD collection was pretty much all horror movies. And then I think randomly, like one or two Disney movies, maybe that I'd got. Oh, I think like I think about then I'd Pokemon on DVD. I think, um, and now that would make a good horror. Yes, and I just by pure chance in Tesco they had a, a Audrey Hepburn box set, five films for ten pound. Wow! And I was literally just like, one, I'm a working class bloke from Mansfield. I like a bargain. Five <laughs> films for ten pound. <laughs> Don't matter that they're old films. No. Five films, ten pound. And second of all, like I obviously knew who Audrey Hepburn was, just like people know who Marilyn. Most people who walk around with a Marilyn Monroe handbag or a Marilyn Monroe poster on their wall, yeah, never seen a Marilyn Monroe film in their life. No. Audrey Hepburn, I feel, is one of a very small number of performers. She is on that level. Yeah, loads of people have got the Breakfast at Tiffany's artwork and have never seen Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I was just like, fuck it, yeah, let's see what the fuss about Audrey Hepburn is. And I'd always heard about Breakfast at Tiffany's as well. Uh, there's a whole song about it that used to play on the radio at work. Yep. So I bought it, and the first one I watched in the box set was Breakfast at Tiffany's. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, that's the most famous one. Everyone knows the title, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yep. Was shocked by it, because it wasn't what I thought. I'd been taking, the char I'd been taking it very literally, and was like, oh, there must be a character called Tiffany, who like... Owns a diner, and they it's all like Monica's have... apartment in Friends, but it's Tiffany's. So yeah, I honestly, goes to breakfast at I honestly was picturing it being something like that, like they all hang out at this girl's apartment. Mm. Um, Tiffany's and it's is not. A shop, it's isn't it? Tiffany's, the jewelry jewelry store. Right. And every morning she goes and eats pastry outside the window and looks in at all the jewelry that she'll never be able to afford. And it was an interesting film to watch. Um, it's a good Audrey Hepburn performance. Mm. It was one of the. It was one of the few. When I say older film, I'm talking like pre-1970. Most films I'd seen at this point in my life had been 1970 onwards. And even the 70s was a bit of a wish-wash for me, other than like Alien and Halloween, which are all late 70s. I'd mo And Texas Chainsaw is 74. I'd seen mostly 80s, 90s and early noughties films at this point. Watching Breakfast at Tiffany's, what struck me was the ways in which filmmaking has not changed and the ways in which it has, i.e. it's a lot slower paced than most modern films are and the rampant racism in the movie. Oh, really? In the character of Mr. Yunioshi, who is a Japanese landlord. He's Holly's yeah. landlord. 
played by distinctly not Japanese Mickey Rooney. Oh God, that was in that in film. In Yellow Face. Oh no, I've, I've seen the clip of Mickey Rooney. Big old Rooney's. buck teeth in, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that ruins the film a bit. But other Honest than that. Sli- somewhat now. That bit aside, mm. I enjoyed the movie. Yeah. And the next one I watched out of the box set was Roman Holiday. Don't know why. Don't know why that's the one I picked. Uh, I think maybe it was because I recognised Gregory Peck because I'd seen him an older get Gregory Peck yeah. in The Omen. He's the main guy in the first Omen movie. And you know what? I loved it. It was a little slow. There's bits in it that definitely, yeah. as a modern audience member, there's bits in it where I'm a, even me, who has more patience than some people, I'm a bit like, come on, you could get through this bit. Yeah. Um, but I loved it. I, I really liked Roman Holiday. I've seen it. It's one of those films, though. I don't know if you, do you ever get this. A film you really like, really like it, but you're not going to watch it often. Yeah. I'm a little like it, not, not that I want to turn this into VGMP, but you know I'm a bit like it with Code Veronica. Code Veronica is one of my least played Resident Evil games, right. but it's my favourite one. But that's why I don't play it too often. You don't want to spoil it. I don't want to take the shine off it. Sure. And Roman Holiday is like that for me. I saw it when I was 16. I'm now 33. You don't want it to outstay its welcome. I've only seen it three times, including this time. Right. So I saw it the very first time. I watched it again about four years ago. One one very lonely day when I was very depressed. I decided to put it on. And it both helped and hindered. Um, it, <laughs> it helped in the sense that I had a very new... Appre- that was the first time... I enjoyed it the first time. The second time I noticed how good the acting actually is. Yeah. Because I, I do have that switch in my head that's unfair of me. Where I kind of think of all sort of pre-1970 acting as not really very good acting. Ooh. I always think of it, which is false and it's a problem yeah. with me. Yeah. But I always go to the whole, oh, oh, God. You're thinking of oh. melodrama. Yeah. Not everything was a melodrama before no. that point. No, no. But I always go but to But I know what you mean, because when I, when I watch the original Metropolis, mm. fuck me. Like, it's a great film. But, it, it, I mean, it is just melodrama. Mm. So everyone is a waif, including the men. Yeah. They're all just sitting there like, oh, no. Oh. Yeah. You're like, Jesus Christ, man. Like, pull yourself together. <laughs> um, but to this day, this is still one of the only black and white films I've ever seen. I've not seen many black and whites. I've seen the original the original Night of the Living Dead is black and white. Yep. In fact, that's the latest black and white I've ever seen, I think, because that's 1968. Yep. Um, I've seen Roman Holiday. I've seen a few Audrey Hepburns in black and white. You watch Wages of Fear on this show. Wages of Fear. To be honest, the majority of black and white films I've seen are all, are all Alfred Hitchcock films. Right. Because to this day, I will still argue that Hitchcock is one of the greatest directors that has ever lived. Um, there is a reason he's called the master of suspense. Um, well, um, Psycho would count. Yeah, yeah. Psycho is a Hitchcock film. Yep. Oh, um, oh, yeah, of course it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Psycho was... I think Psycho was... Oh, we did watch... Did um, I see Psycho or Night of the Living Dead first? I don't remember which one of those I saw first, but one of those two is the first black and white film I ever saw. Right. We did also... Was it both of us watched... Not Citizen Kane, the other one, the one with the bombs. Doctor Strangelove. Uh, no, I've seen that separate to you. Right, yeah. yeah I hated that. I didn't enjoy it either. I that is also a black it. and white film. It is, um, you're right. I watched... All the Marx Brothers movies, mm. including the RKO one, mm. um, yeah, they didn't really do colourful films. Even the the later films where they didn't really share the screen together, like Love Happy, mm. um, even that one was black and white. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so all of the Marx Brothers stuff I've watched, uh, Wages of Fear, because I was the one who brought onto the show. I've seen uh, Seventh Seal. Yeah. Uh, that's black and white. Hell, I've watched a lot of black and white films. Uh, the I men haven't... I watched that recently, mm. that was black and white, and I'm, uh, Gaslight, I've I got think... that, co- I haven't watched it yet, but Gaslight is one that I definitely yeah. want to watch soon, and that one's definitely black and white. I don't think I've asked, have you seen a lot of Hitchcock? I don't think we've talked a lot about Hitchcock. You and I haven't discussed Hitchcock very much, I've seen some, but not lots. Mm, um, he's one of my favourite directors, and I've never... It, you know what, it's one of those directors that I never bother to go out of my way to watch, mm. but I've never disliked a film of his I've seen. No. Um, but for some reason, I've just never bothered seeking mm. him out. Have I don't know why he, that is either. Have you ever seen one he did in the 40s? It's a black and white one called Rebecca. Right. Um, you've not seen that one? No, I've not seen so Rebecca. So it's got Laurence Olivier in it. Yeah. And the character, Rebecca, doesn't appear in the whole film. Right. But the entire film, you feel her presence. You never meet her. 
You never see it. She's, if I remember right, she's dead at the time the film starts. Right, but you can. But feel her, her presence haunts the entire film. Oh, that's brilliant. See, that's yeah. great. I love that stuff. There's. Um, I've also seen the original Nosferatu. Um, I've never seen that the whole way through. You know. Yeah. Oh, oh! I tell you what, black and white one I have seen from around that time period. Though, have you ever seen the Cabinet of Doctor Caligari? No, I have not. That's a 1920s German expressionist film. Ooh. Have you seen? You're familiar with Rob Zombie, aren't you? Yes. Have you seen his music? He wasn't around in 1920s. No. <laughs> have you seen his music video for the song "Living Dead Girl"? Probably not. I've seen the one oh. for Dracula. Right, because "Living Dead Girl," that whole video. Living Dead Girl is a great song, though. Oh, it's a great song. The whole music video is a tribute to Dr. Caligari. Oh, yeah. interesting. It's very. So it's all. When I say it's German Expressionist, what I mean is it's all on sets and none of it's designed to look real. The tree, I'll tell you who it definitely got inspiration from it is Tim Burton. Yeah. It's a very, it's Burton about 40 years before Burton was born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Burton does a lot of um, black and white style stuff, but he, do, he does manage to splash in quite a lot of colour. Yeah. Uh, I think he did one, didn't he do Ed Wood? And that was he black did. and white. I've seen that. I've never seen Ed Wood. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, the original Metropolis is black and white, obviously. Mm. Uh, yeah, quite a lot of mm. black and whites in yeah. my back catalogue, but so they're kind sh- of sporadic. On the beach uh, that we uh, you mentioned mm. in the quiz, that That's one's black, black and white. white. Um, so is this your? This isn't your first Hepburn film, is it? Because you've done My Fair Lady before. I watched My Fair Lady when I was younger, um, but most of her back catalogue I've not yet seen. Right. So this is quite a new. And how about Gregory Peck? Is it this and On the Beach are the only two? No, no, I've seen quite a lot of Peck. I saw seen... his Moby Dick. I saw. Oh, have you seen his Moby Dick? Is yeah. it any good? Oh, it's fucking great as Moby Dick. Have you seen To Kill a Mockingbird? That's oh, he's not most... Moby Dick, obviously. He's no, Captain he's Ahab. Ahab isn't he? uh, yeah, he gives a great Ahab. Because of that, I actually thought he was older than he is. Because mm. uh, in that, obviously, he's actually a not young man, but he's mm. like, you know, 30s, 40s. But yeah, no, um, Gregory Peck I've seen a lot more of, just by a pure chance. Really um, good actor, Gregory Peck. Oh, powerhouse. That's why I'm really looking forward to watching um, uh, Black Legion. Because I can imagine, obviously, being an, anti-race, uh, an anti-racism film mm. that's about the KKK, and he's the main character, yeah. I can imagine the, the sort of performance he's going to have to give in that mm. is going to be fucking ass-kickingly good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what that has to say. Yeah. With uh, certainly with such a powerhouse actor, he was he not also in To Kill a Mockingbird? Yeah, that's what yeah. I was that's his most famous film. Yeah, because he's the um, he's the lawyer who's defending yeah. the. Yeah, I've the never seen. Defendant. I've never seen To Kill a Mockingbird. I've never seen it or read it. I've never seen it all the way through. I've seen the famous scene at the end with Gregory Peck. Right. So for those who don't know, Roman Holiday is about a princess, Princess Anne, played by. Audrey Hepburn. I don't think the film ever explicitly states what country she's the princess of. No, they actually go out their way not to. Yeah, they deliberately because leave that. they. I think the idea was that if, like, it's kind of half suggested that it might be Britain, but I, so on the IMDb thing, it states that it's suggested it's probably going to be Eastern Europe somewhere. Mm. But they leave it vague. I always see. I, they didn't I want to piss to, off the royal family. I seem to remember there being a suggestion that it's Scandinavia. Yeah, I think the, they kept throwing hints to different places I'm to sure, throw you off the yeah. trail of it. Because I'm sure at one point, I'm sure Anne isn't her official name, is it? There's a bit where no. they give her a name that sounds like a more Norwegian pronunciation of Anne, yeah, like Ein or something like that. Mm. Uh, but anyway, point is, it's irrelevant. She's a princess on a speaking tour, and she's currently in Italy in Rome. Uh, meanwhile, Gregory Peck plays Joe, who is a sort of washed-up Jack the Lad type, who is supposedly a reporter, but we kind of get the impression he's sort of just writing garbage stories to earn a paycheck. He kind of wishes he was back in New York, and he's also a compulsive gambler yes and is in quite a lot of debt. Um, there's a bit where his landlord says that he still owes him rent, and there's also a bit where his boss says, before he makes a bet with his boss, he already owes him $500 and then makes a bet for a further $500. Yes. And the princess is getting fed up of this overly scheduled, regimented life that she's being forced to live. And one night they sedate her because she's struggling to sleep, but she decides to go on the run and climbs out her window, doesn't she? And ends up wandering the streets of Rome, 
where eventually the sedative takes effect and she passes out on a park bench. Yes. Which is where she meets Gregory Peck, who, being the upstanding gentleman that he is, tries to stick her in a cab and send her on her way, but the guy driving the cab is like, no, 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 nobody. You can't leave this unconscious chick in my cab. Yeah. And go away. So which he is ends- understandable. Yeah. So he ends up <laughs> taking her back to his place. Mm. Uh, this whole time not realising that she's a princess. The next day, he realises who she... She's still asleep in his room. He goes to work and realises who she is. So he makes a, a deal with his boss that if he can get an exclusive story from her, real, like, dirty detail type thing, like, not official princess answers, but, like, who she is as a person, what she likes, what she dislikes. Tabloid garbage, basically, Basically, yeah. yes. Real basically, celebrity who's... gossip shit. Yeah, yeah, who she... Like, stuff that's standard nowadays. Yeah, complete with pictures. You know, look um, what happened with Meghan and Harry. Yeah, you know, it's like that every... sort of stuff. Yeah, the everyone's 50s. sitting there going, you know what, I always hated Harry anyway. Oh, Meghan, yeah. blah, 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 blah. It's like... No one cares. Yeah, his but boss apparently tells some him. people cared enough that they would sell a whole newspaper. I know. Uh, his boss tells him that if he can get a story like that, that'd be worth. I think he says five thousand, which would have been a lot in the fifties back then. Yeah. yeah. So Gregory Peck makes a bet with him that he can get it, and the bet is for five hundred pounds, five hundred dollars. Sorry. Yeah. Five hundred dollars for the name Carson's going under now. Sorry, that's a good, the bad, and the ugly. Quote. Right. And what you essentially get now from this point forward is for for the whole second act is kind of a standard what has become a standard rom-com plot mm. where he's hanging out with her under false pretenses which is he's trying to get the story yeah but as they're hanging out he's actually falling in love with her realizing how charming she is and in the third act he ends up not going through with publishing the story cuz he realizes it was wrong to manipulate her etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. but what you get in this film that you don't get in a lot of things and we'll get to this cuz i know you want to talk about this mm. uh, but we'll get to it once we've talked about the other two acts sure they don't end up together no. in this film um <laughs> which seems unusual for a film usually subverting the tropes comes after the tropes have been established yeah but this is a film that is somehow both the template for a lot of modern rom-coms, but also modern rom-coms just completely ignore the ending bit. Yeah, they I kind f- of steamroll over this ending to kind of... Because, they want let's happy be endings. honest, to be honest, yeah, you're right, it's, it's because it's a cheap cop-out that makes audiences feel good to yeah. have them get together. Of course they should get together, they've done this whole romance journey, yeah. they should be a couple... Yeah. Um, that's um, something we will discuss in a minute yeah, as we'll you get say to that. but there's I, yeah I, I can understand why they didn't go yeah. for it so the first act is kind of where this is the bit where not I'm suggesting we should because I don't think I don't think you should I do not think you should expect classic films to stick to a modern template no if I were to recut this for a modern template the first act is where I'd cut a lot of stuff because it takes a long time for the film to actually get going. It does take a little bit too long at the first. Um, yeah. You don't really need everything. Uh, but, but I'll what... tell you something that I do like about the first part, though. Mm. Um, it takes too long to get to the, them two together because, let's be honest, that's where the power of this film is, is yes. Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck together. Yeah. Anything prior to that is just preamble and it's too much of it. But once he's picked, he's found on the street and she's drunk, the thing I do like about this film is he, at this point he doesn't know who she is mm. and he's just trying to do the right thing, get her home safe, mm. but he doesn't know where she lives, has to take her to his house. There's things where she's quoting poetry and things like that. There's little things, flashes in there where he's clearly not lusting after her, he's not fancying her as such, mm. but he makes references to things that are that he finds respectable about her despite her seemingly drunk state. Yeah. Because he thinks she's just paralytic from having too yeah. much wine. Um, such a, you know, he's like, oh, well, you're quite well read and blah, blah, blah. And they're little things. Mm. But those are little things that then establish that. And I don't know if this is part of how he performs it that makes this work. Because mm. under a different actor, this may come across worse. Oh. But it doesn't feel like... Because one of my main worries was it was going to be a case of, oh, I don't know who this bimbo is, so I'll just stick her in the bed, whatever. Oh, my God, it's the princess. Hey, darling, I'm here for you. I'm yeah. here for you, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I, I expected that sort of change around. Yeah. He, to be fair, Gregory Peck's performance never does that. Oh, he never feels, because this was my worry going, even back then, going yeah. into Roman Holiday. 
Um, and it's ironic because we've just done, I, I can't remember if this comes out before or after High Plains Drifter, but spoiler, we've recorded High Plains Drifter first. Um, that's the 70s. Yeah. And we're still getting the, you know. She doesn't want it, but oh, she really I'll just wants take it. advantage of you, but it's fine, sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I the fact that this going... came out 20 years before yeah. and didn't do that. I was worried going into this that he was either going to be very leery or even, as you say, he takes a drunk girl home. Like, it could get very dicey. There's another yeah. ver- There's another version of this film in a parallel world. Where, Which is disgusting. Where this gets dicey. Yeah. Um, it doesn't. Like, he, f- Gregory Peck, I don't want to sound like I've got a man crush on Gregory Peck. But he's kind of the perfect blend of a manly man and yet a sensitive gentleman in this movie. Yeah, he gets the tone right. Because uh, he's rough. A very at, difficult balancing. Yeah, I mean, he's rough. He's got an edge to him because he's mm. a gambling addict. And he doesn't mind talking but, shit to her yeah. at any point. Like, it's just, like, he doesn't mind putting her in a but place like, he in never, terms of verbally. He doesn't even try, like, there's none of this, you know, oh, she's asleep, I'm going to kiss her. Um, he doesn't even try and undress her at any point. No. Um, if you I, know I what? There, I... Isn't there one bit where doesn't her skirt fall down while he's making the bed, and he turns away? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he gives um, her a he, he gives her a privacy and a dignity. Yeah. Like... Um, the here's the irony of it. I think from what I've seen of black and white film, and again, I'm not I'm far from an expert on sort of older black and white film. I've seen quite a few, but far from an expert. There seemed to be a point where perviness came back in. So, don't get me wrong. There was there was tone deaf stuff in early cinema. There, you know, there's been this tone deaf stuff now. Yeah, yeah. But for the most part, there was the whole idea of you know she says no and that means yes, etc. That we saw in High Plains Drifter and all of that sort of stuff. That was more an invention of the '60s, and then the '70s basically right. capitalized on it. By the 80s, it was full on, well, women will just do whatever anyway, get their jugs out because that looks good on Animal House uh, or Joysticks, as we reviewed yeah. on VGMP. Um, you know, it, all of the all of the respect for anybody's, you know, nudity went out the window. It's just, oh, just get them out, love. That's what you're good yeah. for. But that was a growth within sort of 20 and 30 years from the 60s. Because that started coming in at the original series of Star Trek, did that a couple of times, mm. but it was never, it wasn't fully extreme, but it was definitely there in a couple of episodes, very dark episodes. Um, but in the fifties, it didn't really come up. Yeah. And films I've seen that are earlier than that, like the Marx Brothers films, you would have thought if it was a, a typical ideal, mm. it would have been somewhere in a comedy Marx Brothers movie. Yeah. Never came up. Yeah. Never came up, and. It seemed to be more so from the late sixties onwards, where we yeah. decided, you know what, women just say no, but they mean yes. I think part of it is when the Hayes Code got scrapped, maybe because all of a sudden it was this. Not, not. I'm not saying this is entirely the reason. No, but I think part of it was all of a sudden all these restrictions are gone. Let's go too far the other way. Maybe, but Which, I think... that happens a lot. If they suddenly turn around and went, <laughs> we've said this before, um, in Britain marijuana is still illegal yes if tomorrow rishi sunak goes right marijuana's legal now you can have it everyone will be off their face everyone will try it <laughs> yeah and after about six months it'll peter it'll out. peter out and only a handful of people who probably would have smoked it anyway are gonna smoke it yeah um but i think anytime you lift a restriction do you know what it's like it's like not as violent it's like malena do you remember we said in malena there's this pressure that builds the whole time the Nazis are occupying Italy. Yeah. And then as soon as the Americans chase the Nazis away, all that pressure releases. And in that film, it releases in the form of them attacking Marlena. Yeah, it turns violent. In yeah. film, maybe the way that released was all of a sudden it was, let's put nudity everywhere, yeah. swearing everywhere, violence everywhere. I think the other thing as well is, is when you look at masculinity in film or mm. in society, but generally in film in this sense... The idea of masculinity in the early 1900s was much more gentlemanly. Mm. So you would respect a woman's boundaries because yeah. you're the gentleman. That's your role. Yeah. When it got through the 60s into the 70s, 
it turned into a much more of a, well, I'm a man, I'll get what I I'll want, however I want. I want. Yeah, okay. Kind of what we call toxic masculinity now. Yeah, so all of a sudden we went from gentlemanly masculinity, which didn't, you know, don't get me wrong, had its other issues as well, but we went from a more gentlemanly masculinity to one where it's like, I take what I want and I'll yeah. get it if I everyone, want it. Everyone thinks they're Genghis Khan. Yeah. I'll take what I want, I'm... Yeah. I'm a conqueror. Yeah. I'm a man. And even if you say no, I know you actually want it because yeah. I want it. So you obviously want what I want. That then obviously has come full circle over the last 20, 30 years yes. where that's been trying, they've tried to remove that. I want to talk a little bit about the sense of humor in this film quickly before yes. we move on plot wise. No, no, of course. Because it's one thing it succeeds at. It succeeds in, but also it's one of the things that has aged it. Okay. If you are not capable of appreciating an older type of comedy, which fair enough, maybe you're not you're not going to like this film. At least you're not going to find the film funny because it's a very naive sense of humor. Like one of the very first jokes in the film is Audrey Hepburn's there giving her talk to the public and she's under her big, massive Royal ball gown. She's trying to take her shoes off. Isn't she? Yeah. Because her feet hurt. Um, and to someone like us, a modern person, and especially towards men and working class men at that, yeah. it's like, bitch, what? <laughs> like, yeah. Just take your fuck. To us, it literally is, if you're uncomfortable, take your shoes off. Yeah. Because I feel like we're more pragmatic. Um, why don't you just wear flats? Obviously. <laughs> but obviously yeah. She can't. It is, honestly, it's, we're just sitting there going, bitch, change your shoes. Yes. Yeah. But obviously, <laughs> she can't. And back then, I feel like that would have been funnier. It would have. Because I think people would have understood like, it more. This yeah. is definitely uh, an upper middle class comedy of its era. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that the humour doesn't land mm. for people who aren't in that bracket. No. There's some. But being the base man that I am, mm. uh, there is some slapstick later on that I found very funny. Yeah. With uh, his photographer friend. Yeah. I'll be honest. Um, Gregory Peck's timing is brilliant in yep. this. Uh, Audrey Hepburn's performance works perfectly which is why she won the oscar i mean she's so incredibly charming in it yeah and then as you say the photographer that comes out later yeah. on which as you say is a hard thing to do as well for a character playing an upper class royal yeah we're, we're not usually bent to having sympathy for that like especially i've noticed you know I, I don't mean this as an insult so please don't take it as one although if you do i apologize i've noticed when we just in the films we've talked about so far on this and occasionally on VGMP, although class issues don't tend to come up too much in VGMP films. No, they're People not that are too sort busy of a movie, are they? Or space invaders. <laughs> um, I think you have less patience or tolerance for stories about well-off people. Me personally. Yeah. I'd agree with you. It's something I've noticed when yeah, we've yeah. talked about like about time and things like that. Yeah, I, I tend to find that their issues aren't really all that important. Yeah, and I know that first sounds... world problems, as they say. Yeah, I'm like, mm. I, don't get me wrong, I understand it. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry you're feeling bad, but these people are dying. Yeah, why should I give a shit that you're? Yeah, you broke a nail. Yeah, it's exactly. a it, bad luck, but like, who's so shit? Yeah, so I think it's a very, I think it's a big testament to Audrey Hepburn's performance and to the writing mm. that you're able to watch this and sympathise with her character. Yes, and the. You know, that she essentially has been born into a self-imposed duty that is going to rule her life, presumably for the entirety of her life. We'll discuss is that more in Act 3, I think, because yeah. that it comes up a lot more into how it this does. film finishes. Yeah, it's definitely in Act 1 and Act 3, and then it kind of gets forgotten for the whole of Act yeah, 2. Yeah, because Act 2 is just them getting kind of getting together and yeah. you know trying to a perform the ruse and yeah. b drop the ruse i will just say about audrey hepburn's performance because this is one of my favorite facts about this film uh gregory peck at this point was one of the most famous men in hollywood yes and audrey hepburn was an unknown at this point gregory peck's contract actually stated that he should be credited as the lead actor he was all top much, billing wasn't he all top billing bigger font everything oh he was the only one on the poster as well yeah initially well on the planning side yeah and I think it was, I think they said it was after the first week of filming. Mm. He rang his agent and said, you've got to arrange it so Audrey gets equal billing. Yeah. And the agent went, don't be ridiculous. Like, you've earned the right to have top billing. You can't do that. And he apparently turned around and said, I can do what I want. And, and moreover, if I don't do this, I'm going to look like a fool because I'm telling you this girl's going to win the Oscar. Yeah. And she did. Yeah. Um, so he... 
whether you argue whether he did it to be it'll nice look or shitty on him own. as well, wouldn't it? If she wins the Oscar, and it's like, yeah, the Gregory Peck's the only starring name yeah. on the poster role, and she's the one with the yeah. Oscar. So whether he did it for nice reasons or for self-preservation think... doesn't matter. The point is, mm. he could see after one week of working with her, yeah. that she was going to be a star. I think also to be uh, no, not let's not take that away from Gregory Peck. To be honest, no, uh, there's plenty of actors who would. Hell, I know you like him, but you agree he's out. Fucking Shatner. Yeah. In the in Star Trek original series, he had it contractually mandated that Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly's names was had smaller. to be 20% smaller than his name. Yeah, in the in intro the credits. credits. Yeah, because he's the bigger name. William fucking Shatner. I like William Shatner. I oh, do, yeah. despite his flaws. Um, but if Gregory Peck can suck it up, you can suck it up, William Shatner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And here's the thing. like, it, it, I mean, there's no point going after older people for things they did no. 60 years ago no. but at the same token we can recognize ego or a lack thereof when it comes up yeah um and something to be fair with gregory peck the type of projects he did things like on the beaches mm. which he gets equal billing with ava gardner mm. uh, such as this where he gave mm. equal billing to and correctly so to audrey mm. hepburn because the film wouldn't work without her honestly i'm shocked looking at gregory peck's filmography and the little the little i do know because i'm not a gregory peck expert no I am very surprised. I think he definitely came close. I'm surprised he didn't get cancelled by the House of Un-American Activities Committee. I think he I, nearly did, because On the Beaches nearly did. Yeah. I want to talk about a scene in this first act then. I actually like the scenes with the newspaper editor. Yes. I actually think they're fairly funny. They are funny. They're good. They're well written. When he goes in, and because he oversleeps, doesn't he? Yes. And he's trying to bluff that he's already done the princess interview. And the editor of She Knows That The Princess has been reported as sick. She's actually missing, but she's been reported as sick. And he's, he's like, egging him on, isn't he? He's like, and what did she say her opinion was about uh, European Union or something like that? And he's like, well, um, she thought it was a good idea to keep your friends close. And he's, like, clearly bullshitting. Yeah. Um. I thought that was pretty good, even though that editor character is kind of a stock character. Yeah. It worked. Yeah, I could almost imagine him. He was sort of a 1950s J. Jonah Jameson type. I was going to say I, that. I, I yeah, could imagine he's... him saying to Gregory Peck, bring me pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's exactly what that character needed to be. Yeah. Because he didn't have enough screen time to be a fully fleshed out character. No. But he needed to bring the comedy with him. And that was... Yeah, that's what he does. That that's I'm guessing that guy. I haven't seen him in anything else, but I assume he's probably a, a known character actor. Yeah, I in America so. of the time, um, he rings his landlord, doesn't he, and gets him yeah. to stand outside the the villa with with a gun. A gun. <laughs> it's interesting the the way that that guy performs when he's marching in front of Gregory Peck's door. Oh. I'm wondering what that relates to because bear in mind the time that this came out, it would have been following. Um, World War Two, yeah. quite likely would have suggested that guy would have fought in World War Two. Yeah, me, but he on would have the been bad guy side. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, there's never any specifics impl implicated in that. Could just be an old man seeing what he's like, acting like things he's yeah. seen in film. To but... be fair, we're we're assuming he could have been a resistance fighter against Mussolini. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, is it, I think the thing that takes away any of the possibility of him being a resistance is the fact that the way he walks is more like a military officer. Mm. Like the way he checks the gun, slams it against his mm. shoulder, and then turns. Yeah. Um, but either way, maybe he's just copying what he's seen in films. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was an interesting little side element. Yeah. There are a lot of interesting side characters that are, you know, only brief but fun. Yeah. Do you know what's a joke I didn't get? Go on. I liked the scene, but I didn't quite get the joke. Right. Is when um, when Audrey Hepburn goes into the hairdressers, and she asks for her hair to be cut short. And the barber goes, here? And she goes, shorter. Here? Shorter. And he's getting, like, actively he gets angry. angry. Yeah. And I couldn't work out what. Is it supposed to be that he's frustrated that she's cutting off this? I didn't know if it was, like, a sexism thing, where he's like, why would you cut off this beautiful long hair? Yeah. Because then once he's cut it, he's like, actually, it's amazing, and she looks gorgeous. And... <clears throat> I think might have been... So when was this film? 1950? 54. 1954. I think Wait, women was it didn't... 54, 53? Either way, I don't think women had short hair at this time. No, Audrey Hepburn popularised that. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, a lot of Japanese women loved this film and then copied the hairstyle. Um, but yeah, 
I don't think women generally had short hair at this point. It was considered very much a, a manly thing to have short hair. Yeah. So maybe that's what it was. It is difficult when you're not when when it doesn't explicitly tell you why he's getting angry, and we don't live anywhere near that time frame. Yeah, it then becomes a bit weird because you're right. You watch it and you're like, dude, why are you so angry about? Like, she just wants shorter haircut. If anyone knows exactly why he was angry, if maybe we're completely on a different tangent, we don't understand why. I genuinely don't know why he was getting so angry at her, no. asking for shorter hair. Um, no. Are we correct? Is it that, you know, it was just considered unwomanly to have short hair at this mm. time at time period? Or is there something else that we don't yeah. understand about the culture? Because he doesn't time? seem at all angry about having to do the haircut. Oh, no. And he's he likes it afterwards. And it's not like... like it's... I'd get it if he like did the haircut to one length and then she went, no, sure. And he had to keep doing the haircut. Yeah. But he's not. He's just going here, 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 or here. Yeah. Um, there's a bit of weird bit here, isn't there, where Gregory Peck tries to steal a camera from a little girl. And that is weird. I think he could have done without that. He's trying to do it. He's trying to do it in a smooth way, yeah. but there is no smooth way of doing it. And she's just like, miss. And the teacher just walks up and just, I don't think the teacher has any lines. No, she, she just stares, she just at, stares him. at him. And Gregory Peck's like, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> that was Oops. a little bit of cost cutting measure there because <laughs> that woman definitely would have fucking said something to a man yeah. trying to rob one of the little girls. Yeah, but we don't want to pay her. No. Um, just give the stern look. Yeah, his friend turns up and his friend's got a little spy camera, hasn't he? Yes. Disguised as a Zippo lighter. Yes. Uh, which I thought was wonderful. Is it a camera or is it a voice recorder? It's a camera. Oh, okay. He's, yeah, he's taking photos and then he hands her yes. the photos in an envelope at the end. Um, and I quite liked this scene where he turns up and he doesn't realise that it's meant to be a secret. So he keeps blabbing about this princess. And Gregory Peck's like spilling water on him, yeah, slapping him. Kicking him over. Like To be honest, that's Gregory Peck one, looks like kicks... such a shit friend mm. in this scene. But it is hilarious. Yeah, that's the best one when he kicks the whole chair over. Yeah. And, when the... and he gaslights the guy, doesn't he? Yeah. He's like, oh, look, you fell over there. I didn't fall over. You kicked me. Oh, don't be silly. You're just clumsy. <laughs> <laughs> it was good um, yeah. yeah no I, honestly act two I've got absolutely no yeah. qualms with uh, they ride around on the Vespa as we've said uh, that's obviously a very <laughs> famous moment from the film I have to say I was a little disappointed in that sequence because yeah. um, bear in mind how big it is and how much impact yeah. it had I kind of expected it to be more romantic, yeah. but it wasn't. It was just a, a no. quick comedy bit yeah. where she jumps on a Vespa, rides off, he jumps on the back, and then she almost crashes about 17 yeah. times. Isn't and then weird? that's the end of scene. You never see Vespa again. It's funny, isn't Weirdly it, how enough, such little things catch on in the culture, though. But what's at... weird, though, is that the cover art of it has him riding the Vespa and her on the back, mm. which never happens in the there film. There is this little montage bit where it happens. Is there? Yeah, it's, it's literally, again, it's a blink and you miss it. Yeah, because... Ten I'm... second montage Because the main driving. thing with the Vespa was her driving like a maniac and him right. jumping on the back yeah there's a little bit so uh, yeah, when they, I, right. think, I think when they go to the dance at night they drive there on the best oh maybe but um, it's, it but, does seem to be like you, you've picked up on literally the smallest detail of this yeah. film and but that, made that, that happens, the poster it? look at the first terminator film yeah i'll be back is not a big line it's it's literally it's not like a special line it's not a a a it becomes that for yeah. Arnie's whole career. Yeah. But what, why is it? Why is it of everything in Terminator, the thing that really caught on in the pop culture it's was obvious. just, I'll be back. I'll be back. We can't predict these it's things. It's because of his voice. Yeah. But we, but he's got a load of other lines. Any of the other lines could have done it. Sarah Connor. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's weird, <laughs> isn't it? To be fair, he does get, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> yeah. It is weird, though, isn't it? You can, you can never predict what little parts of a film yeah or a performance or a performance will be the things that catch on in the culture yeah yeah i've always wondered like how the hell would they have known that i'll be back would have caught on because it's just a basic bitch line but actually they couldn't have done a better example because we did an episode on it you said it yourself because obviously you hadn't seen it till we did it on stc you were surprised at how unimpactful in the actual film don't put baby nobody puts baby in a corner is yes it's not a big moment it's just he walks in and goes nobody puts baby in a corner yeah but i kind of expect it to be like this grand swelling moment nobody puts baby in yeah, a corner yeah that's because that you're, that's because you know the cultural impact of that but line. not the actual scene itself yeah. Yeah. yeah um anyway they go to a dance don't they and the barber's there again isn't he yeah and, and he i thought it was cool that it. they the barber got to be part of the dance and mm. you know it, there was no jealousy or anything there. Yeah. And that he helped them out in the fight as well, that ensues after. Yeah, yeah, a big f comedy fight ensues. Yeah. And then on the way back, 
we they get, get attacked by agents, don't they? They've mm. uh, one of the comedy bits they've done with the royals is they've sent out royal guards to look mm. for her dressed as quote unquote civilians. Yeah, and even though they're dressed in like normal suits. They're so like stone faced and rigid that they just stand out like yeah. sore thumbs. <laughs> um, so on the car ride home, this is where you get a very bit. I mean, I would argue this is the most important scene in the whole film. Yeah, this is a really harsh scene. This really bittersweet scene mm. where they've clearly fallen for each other. Gregory Peck hasn't said it yet, but we can kind of tell that, or at least as an audience, we're now hoping he won't go through with selling the story. Yes. And she basically says, we can't be together because she's got all these, you know, she has a life. She has engagements and responsibilities to her country. Yeah, filled with these responsibilities. Yeah. And I really like this bit where she's like, I'm going to walk to the corner and I don't want you to watch me. Um, and she's like tearing up and he's he's doing that really cool thing where you can kind of tell he wants to cry, but he's not going to because he's, he's being a man. Stoic man. Um, and even she, she's not full on like <laughs> sobbing, is she? No, no, she's not turning. She doesn't turn into a waif at any point in this film. No, it, to be honest, it's very what you would expect. Again, from a her. lesser actress probably would have played it that way. Yeah. It's what you expect from someone resigned to their duty. Yeah. You know, I, I know what I want, but my duties. My duty to country comes above than. my heart. Yeah. Um, always makes me choke up a little bit, that scene. Yeah. I'm always like... <laughs> it's a very powerful scene. Um, and she leaves. And the next day, he goes in and tells his boss there is no story. Agrees to... So not only does he not get the story, he then has to agree to pay another five because he's lost the bet. Yeah, so he has to pay... M- another owes- 500 on top of the 500 he owes already. Yep. So that's 1,000. And again, you get a little comedy bit with his photographer because the photographer turns up with the pictures and keeps trying to give them to the editor, doesn't he? Yeah. And he's having to like trip him over and stuff to stop him. Yep. Um, and he gets told, you know, the princess is giving an interview, the one she should have given the other day. You have to go and... Do the interview. Do the interview. And also, this, this whole film, she didn't know he was a reporter. No, he said he was t- uh, involved in something to do with oil, but kept yeah. it quite vague. So when he turns up, he's in the front line, isn't and he? And I think the the reason for that is because he's basically a snake oil salesman mm. for her. I think that was the reference. Yeah. Um, he's sort of standing in the front line. She comes out when she sees him. There's this like flicker of fear on her face where she's like, fuck, he was a reporter. Yeah. Um, oh my God! Like, did I? And you can see in her head she's thinking, "Did I say anything that he could report on? Yeah. Like, have I said anything that's going to cause a scandal?" But also heartbreak because she's a bit like, "Oh my God, he was just a reporter." Yeah. And then he he then disguises his question, doesn't he? Where it's like he doesn't really ask a question; he just sort of says, "We want the Her Majesty to know that we're very happy to have met her and mm. um, that she's had a wonderful time." And they give her the photos, don't they? Yeah. And say this is a commemoration of your time in Rome yeah. sort of thing. So she now knows they're not going to think it. But the film does end with, the, there's not a big cheesy, oh, forget it, I'll abdicate and I'll be with you, or, or oh, guess yeah, what, yeah. you're the king now, or something like that. Instead, they just kind of look longingly at each other. And then have to leave. And he has, she leaves. And he lets everyone else leaves first, doesn't he? He just yeah. lingers for ages and then turns and slowly walks out. And that's it. I mean, that, that comes is... up the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, and no real ending credits because of how old the film is. All the credits are at the top. Yep. Um, so that's a just... blast from the past, isn't it? When they used to do that. Absolutely. Um, um, this ending, yeah. I had a problem with when I watched it. Yeah. Thinking about it more and more over time, I can't think of a better way to end it. Right. But I'm still not happy with the ending. Mm. I understand what you're saying, that A, it's the only ending that really makes sense, and B, the fact that it they don't get together in the end is part of the bittersweet nature of this romance. Yeah. I guess I just, when I want to watch a rom-com, I kind of like the idea that the fucking romantic leads get together at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Seems bollocks otherwise, yeah. but... As far as the narrative's concerned, it does make sense for Roman Holiday to not end with them together. Um, I think your only two options are she quits being a royal. Yeah. In which case, they still wouldn't have a happy life together because she would be hounded for the rest of her life by the press. Yeah. Or they do some 
bullshit where they're like, oh, actually, Gregory Peck, did you know that you're like the second cousin oh, no, twice no, no, no. removed? No, 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 no. I've seen that second one played out so many times. It is the worst ending to a yeah, film like exactly. this. Yeah, exactly. No, no, I wouldn't want that either. Um, I guess I'd just prefer she abdicates and they have a happy ever after, but yeah. I do understand what you're saying. Reality is, I mean, look at Prince Harry and Meghan. Though that being said, they've not helped themselves by keep going on press tours. Yeah. Um, but what, what, what's the quote from South Park? I just want my respect my privacy. My privacy. Respect my privacy. And then he wipes his balls on Carl's window. <laughs> I'm gonna Why blue is nobody balls respecting it? my privacy? <laughs> yeah. Plays drums on his front lawn until Carl looks at us. Hey, respect my privacy. <laughs> but um, anyway, the idea is. That I would prefer that they get together. Mm. I do understand why this film doesn't do that. And I have been taxing myself to try and write a better ending where they get together. Mm. And I can't find it. No. So, can't really blame the filmmakers yeah. for going this route. That being said, you are right. I, I tend to be a little bit more negative when it comes to um, upper class shit. Mm. And this ending definitely stinks of upper class shit. Yeah, I mean, I do get it because, like, when I read the story about Edward the Seventh and wanting to marry Wallace Simpson, yeah, I was a bit like, so just let him marry the fucking, con yeah. like, fucking. But they, they even today they still do this because do you remember when William married Kate Middleton? Yeah, they had to do a thing, you know, where they had to like trace her family lineage because she. T According to them, she's a commoner. She's yeah. still way up a class than we are. Oh, I know. But she, 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 her from parents Cambridge are like the 36th richest people in the country. So yeah. She's not but poor. according to the royal family, she's a commoner. Yeah. In order to justify her marrying William, yeah. they had to trace her family history back something like 12 generations. I don't care. To prove. No, I don't this care. is what I'm saying, Fuck though. the royal family. What They're I'm... the world's biggest sponges. Oh, I agree. I agree. But what I'm saying is this is still a weird thing that they cling yeah. to today. Yeah. Um, where like they had to go all the way back down her family tree to be able to prove that there was a tangential link where she's like at some point related to the royal line oh, and you're so like bollocks. you're like this is it's too that i mean when did she marry him like 2012 or something something like that like it's... dude it's 2012 like come on get into a new feckin millennium anyway i'll tell you what, let, let, can i ask this question just mm. as a thought experiment yeah we do the same film yeah, goes yeah. the same way the difference is she's not royal no 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 he's the royalty and she's the journalist yeah right the rest of the film is exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as satisfied that at the end, basically, she has to fuck off and be penniless for the rest of her life instead of being able to marry him, the king, or the, in this case, the prince royalty who's mm. come to town and shared a great holiday with her yeah. and they both love each other but i'm sorry he has to do his royal duty yeah. so i'm afraid she, her the peasant has to go back i'll be honest i think that is a less brave ending at the time period because at that time period it was very especially and even today to an extent but then it very was a uh, you know, men's duty comes before anything else. So yeah. for him to make that choice to stay royal, yeah, it doesn't feel like a big deal. It, it feels why like... is it different when it's her doing it? Because back then, and obviously, I'm not saying this is right. This is just sexist attitudes of the time. Hmm. Back then, women were expected to put love and family and romance in front of everything else yeah so the fact you can almost argue it's a feminist move <laughs> that yeah, she chose yeah. she chooses her duties and her career arguably if you can call being a royal a career i suppose technically that is their or career. if you can call it feminist empowerment because basically she chooses to be pampered for the rest yeah, of her that life that's true that's the, that is the <laughs> that's the inevitable problem this is what yeah. this is what you're getting at i think though the yeah. inevitable oversight in this film is we're never presented that part of her life. No. We're only presented the negative of being a royal, which is there are certain experiences that she's never going to get to have. Yeah. And her life is constantly going to be regimented and overseen. Yeah. Which, yes, that's very... But I'd hate to live that way. Yeah, no. But yeah, I get that. The, where you then get into the argument, because you're not wrong, but where you then get into the argument is, would you want a rom-com to go into all that detail? And you might... I personally probably would. And some wouldn't. Maybe not this film, some though. I, I will say maybe not this film. Yeah, like, if it was, say, a, if this was more of a drama, yeah. you might be a bit more like, well, it'd be interesting to see a... 
this you is, know, a more hmm. more engaged discourse on yeah. the pros and cons of her life. Sure. As opposed to we're only presented cons so that we feel sorry for her. Yeah. I I think the other thing as well is that's that's always a bit of a problem with rom coms as a genre mm. is they often, in order to be interesting and stand out, have to bring in interesting ideas. But because of the type of genre they are, mm. they can never really fully explore the subject matter of that genre. So because they basically, oh, we'll keep it light, mate. You don't need to go too dark. We're meant to be having a laugh here and yeah. a romance thing. But also, even if it's a tragic rom-com, which very rarely a thing, this is probably one of the few tragic rom-coms, um, even with that in mind, like you can only dabble on it a little bit because you either damage the romance of it or you damage the comedy. Mm. So because you have to keep it somewhat previous, or bre- give it a bit of brevity, sorry, mm. because you have to give it some brevity, you can't really explore themes, yeah. but you have to set them up because otherwise people go, why would I watch that over another film? Yeah. I know it's like, for example, The Proposal is a good example of this. I love The Proposal. I know it's the one we're going to do eventually on this channel. Um, and that's uh, a power like dynamic of you know a wealthy woman and a poor guy or relatively poor guy um and it doesn't really explore the themes of the age gap it doesn't really explore the themes of blah 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 because it's too busy trying to make you have a fun time and a romance so i get it but for some reason with that maybe it's me you know what hold my hands up maybe it's me with the proposal i didn't expect anything more deep so when it didn't really give me a lot of depth, I didn't feel... Care. Yeah, I didn't care. Because I was like, I wanted a bit of cheesy fun. I got it. It was good fun. Yeah. I loved it. Also, it helps that they got together at the bloody end. Mm. Um, whereas with this, they don't get together at the end, which makes it more of a tragedy, uh, which is not usually subject matter for the ending of a rom-com. And because it's, I suppose, an older black and white film with two powerhouse actors in the leads... Maybe that's my fault of expecting a little bit more. Mm. Um, it is a great film. Yeah. I'm not slagging this film off at all. Uh, I think maybe I came to it with more expectation than I should have. Right. Um, and you know me, I tend to overthink shit. You know, <laughs> But uh, it doesn't help as well when it starts off with, she's a, just a poor little princess. Oh, yeah. fucking is she now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is definitely a well, me problem. Well, is me. Yeah. My diamond shoes are too tight. Yeah, it is that, though, isn't it? Okay. Well, I think that's all there is to say about Roman Holiday. Would you watch it again? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is something I'll keep on DVD for years to come. Yeah. Probably watch it once every 10 years or so. Yeah. I'm looking forward to watching this again at some point. Yeah. Hopefully with a a partner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Because I think it's a a good one to watch with a a girlfriend. It is. Yeah. Um, Well, that was Roman Holiday. That was us going back to a land before colour. Yes. Um... But we'll be back next week with another exciting episode of Second Take Cinema. Uh, if you get time and if you've enjoyed this show, please do like, share, subscribe, etc., etc. Leave us a review if you could. That would be lovely and much appreciated. You can also check out our other show, VGMP, the Video Game Movie Podcast, where we talk about video game-based movies with a bit more of a comedic tinge on that show. Um, because I, quite frankly, it's necessary to talk about those topics. And you can find that on all the same podcasting apps where you found Second Take Cinema. Um, Please do enjoy. And until next time, have a great day.